Nehemiah chapter number 9. We are moving closer towards the end of Nehemiah. And God has been ministering to his people through the book of Nehemiah. If you recall, the first six chapters are rebuilding the physical walls of the city. And in chapter 7, we began to see the spiritual work taking place in the lives of the people. Remember, what's on the inside is more important than what's on the outside. Okay, God is more concerned on, about who you are. God's more concerned about your character than he is your appearance. We live in a society that's infatuated by appearance. And nothing wrong with appearance. Uh, but the reality is, is that God is more concerned on the inside. And so this is what we're seeing. The emphasis of Nehemiah is now shifting onto the people. It was the walls. Now it's the people. And spiritual restoration is taking place. Spiritual reformation is, is, is active right now in the book of Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, if you recall, last week we were introduced to the idea of how the Word of God alone promotes spiritual restoration in the lives of the people. Okay? And so, uh, remember, they found the book of the law, and, and, and they called Ezra the scribe, and they said, Ezra, come and read to us the Word of God. And remember, Ezra read... From morning time until midday. And remember, I challenge you, don't be complaining about how long I preach anymore, okay? I'll take you to Ezra and, and his six-hour sermon and shut you down <laughs> fast. One of the things, this is important because we're going to transition from the end of Nehemiah 8 to the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 9. It's tragic sometimes that, that we end chapters and it's like we, we shift so fast away from what had transpired a, a week prior. But everybody look right up here. Chapters and verses are man-made in the Word of God. When God inspired His Word, He didn't inspire, well, this verse goes here and this chapter goes. This is for us to help us. Okay, and so Nehemiah chapter 8, sometimes we stop Nehemiah chapter 9 and we forget what has taken place. If you do that here, you're going to miss the sermon today. Okay, you cannot do that because where did we end last week? Here's where we ended. Ezra is, is revealing the word of God back to the people and, and, and God's people are being broken over their sin and what they come in contact with was... This idea that they are supposed to be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of the Booths. And it was two weeks away. And so what did they do? They made preparations and, and they built them booths and they, they made them temporary tabernacles. So the Feast of Tabernacles, here's what happened. They would make a temporary booth and they were required to live in that booth or that, that tabernacle, so to speak, for seven days. Okay? This was to remind them of what God did for them in their wilderness wanderings. Remember, God did not forsake his people. Even in times of chastisement, God did not forsake his people. Everybody look right up here. You've got to get past this idea that God's just going to write you off. Sometimes we get this mindset, well, you know, I've messed up too much, and I've, I've done this, and, you know, I've really been a horrible person, and, and, and we kind of develop this mindset. God's at some point, he's just going to write me off. God doesn't write us off. He writes us in. God loves us, okay? But he'll chastise those that he loves, and we're going to see that in, in our text. And, and God will correct you if you belong to him. But even in times of chastisement, even in times of correction, God is still faithful, and God still provides, and God will still even bless you during those times. And so they were to recount through the Feast of the Booths, they were to recount the faithfulness of God even in their times of the wilderness wanderings. Okay? Very important to understand. The Feast of the Booths took place on the 14th day of the seventh month. We're going to pick up on the 24th day of the seventh month. So what you're going to see is the Feast of the Booths went from the 14th day to the 22nd day. This is going to be important, and I'll show you why in just a minute. We're going to pick up Nehemiah chapter 9 in, on, in the seventh month and in the 24th day. So if you have your place in Nehemiah chapter 9, would you shout a big amen? amen? If you said amen, even if you didn't, would you stand as we give reverence to the reading of God's word? Nehemiah chapter 9, we're going to read 
the first six verses. I am, I'm not skipping over the text. I am going to deal with the text, and then we're going we're to move down uh, during the sermon. But for the sake of time, uh, due to the long chapter, we're going to move down uh, to verse 32 after we read the first five verses. The Bible says this, Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquity of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read, from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of a day. Six hours, right? So now we're, we're coming back to reading the book of the law for another six hours. But notice it didn't stop there. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worship the Lord their God. So for six hours, they're reading from the law. Now, for six hours, they're confessing their sins. And they're worshiping God. According to my calculations, that's half of a day. Now, if this were to take place in most churches today, there'd be some resignations taking place. Oh, preacher, you're going way too long. Preacher, we've got to get down to the McDonald's. We've got to get down to the, to the eatery. Let us go. Let my people go. Amen. <laughs> it's this idea. But, but here we are. Now, now notice... And on the stairs of the Levites stood some of our brothers and some of our sisters. I'm going to do that again. Yes, I am. I'm skipping over the names because I'm not smart enough to pronounce them. Verse, verse number, uh, at the end of verse number five, and they said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Verse number six through verse number 31 is a recount of the history of Israel and the faithfulness of God in the midst of that. In, in the second point of the sermon, I'm going to kind of walk you through that. I'm kind of in a fast pace, but I am going to recount that. I'm just not going to read it now. But it is a prayer that is recounting the history of Israel and the faithfulness of God in the midst of that history. Look down into verse number 32. Now, therefore, our God... The great and mighty and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, upon our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people, since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. God, we have been wicked, but you have been faithful. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves and its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Look at verse 38. Because of all of this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. Let us bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we ask you to take the reading of your word and apply it to the hearts of your people. Lord, feed the sheep of your pasture this morning. God, we acknowledge, Lord, that only you can feed the sheep. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll take your word and instruct and rightly divide the word of truth. God, we pray that you will accomplish what only you can through the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I'm only a man. I am limited in what I can accomplish Lord, you can accomplish all things. So, Lord, we trust you. We acknowledge that if anything happens, it will be you that does it. God, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for what's done. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <laughs> 
The Bible in Nehemiah chapter number 9, verse number 1, introduces us into this time, into the life of Israel. Notice what it says. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth with earth on their heads. This is a picture of mourning. This is a picture of, of, of brokenness in the lives of these people. And, and, and one of the things that I want to call your attention to is that we don't see that in the end of Nehemiah chapter number 8 because they were right in the midst of celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. One of the things that was to take place in the midst of that feast was a time of praise and thanksgiving to God for all that he had done. So mourning was not permitted during that time. Okay, so now that we see that time has come to a close, the, the, they've celebrated the feast, they, they put down their temporary boost, now they're back in their homes. They were just praising God and they were just in a spirit of thankfulness but now two days later they're in a period of mourning and brokenness how many would agree the Bible says there's a time and a season for all things there really is there's a time of thanksgiving there's a time of praise but there's also a time to be broken before God there's also a time to, to be mournful over God and understand it was because of the reading of the Word of God that had brought them to this place because their lives had literally been exposed and, 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 and all of their past sins had, had come face to face with it through the reading of the Word of God. And so the first thing that I want you to see in our text is notice number one, uh, through this God repairing what is broken, notice the conviction of God. Notice the conviction of God that has taken place. That, that First is the reading of the law and then the conviction of God. See, conviction always follows the proclaiming of the Word of God. Because remember, what is the Word of God? It's the revelation of God to mankind. So God reveals Himself, and any time that we come face to face with the revelation of God, we acknowledge that God is holy and we are not. Remember when Isaiah got in the presence of God, what he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a sinful man. I, I get real leery of these people that claim they get real, real close to God, and they just think they're so close and holy. To Listen, the closer that you get, the more imperfections that you see in your own life. Why? Because of the holiness of God and who he is. And so the, the word of God has been proclaimed to the people. And, and remember, they were in, in exile and they were in Babylon and, and they had been separated from the law of God and separated from the word of God. And now that it has been proclaimed, it, they come face to face with who they really are before God and, and they just become broken. An entire generation, you're talking about 70 years through the Babylonian exile, there was no reading of God's word. And now all of a sudden they come face to face with the law again and, and, and God just does a number in these people's lives. God brings conviction and that's what I want you to see is the conviction of God that takes place. Everybody look right up here. The conviction of God is a blessing from God. It does not make you feel good. There is nothing about, and, and I get real leery about uh, an entire generation in the American culture that, that when, they, when they pick a church and when they want to uh, find a church, they, they, they want to feel good when they're in church. And I was talking with Ken this week, Ken Allen, and uh, him and I were discussing some things, and, and uh, I don't know, we were talking about conviction, talking about maybe Nehemiah. I don't remember, Ken, exactly the conversation, but I do remember exactly what he said. When it comes to church, this is what Ken said. He says, if I'm not going to be convicted at church, I can just stay home. I might as well just stay home because I can, I, I can worship God at home. But no, this is the idea of coming into the presence of God and God convicting us. But notice, I want you to see this from the text. Notice what took place when the conviction of God came. Notice number one, it says, The people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth with earth on their heads. Number one, we see brokenness. If you want to get God's attention, be broken before God. Be broken before God and, and understand that, that, that we, we don't always have it all together. We, it's this idea that, that we're not always right where we need to be with God. And, and, and so they had acknowledged this and they, they had fell their faces to the uh, floor, so to speak. And, and here they are in sackcloth and fasting and, and, and with the earth on their heads. And, and, and they were in a time of mourning and brokenness before God. And the Lord was looking upon his people. 
And God was in the process of restoring those people. But not only do we see brokenness here, but notice this. I love this. Because of the conviction of God, the conviction of God does bring brokenness. But notice this. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins. Notice that. If you underline in your Bible, underline that. They stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of, the, of their God for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of it, they made confession. There's that word again. They confessed their sins. And as I begin to meditate on this this week, a thought hit me that the American church has really got this idea of confession down, but we've got it backwards. You know what? We've become experts on confessing everybody else's sins. I mean, you know, we look at a world, and, and we look at a world that's falling apart, and it's like, man, we, we are so quick to confess everybody else's sins. Let me ask you, when was the last time you confessed your sin before God? When was the last time, and, and, and there's been, I, there are two instances I, in my life this week that God just, just made it very clear to me that I needed confession. I needed confession. It was just plain and simple that it was me. It wasn't someone else, and, you know, sometimes it's, well, I'm looking at my spouse, or I'm looking at my children, and I'm looking at a lost world, and I'm looking at these people that don't have it all right, and, 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 and this whole idea that we're always confessing other people's sins, but what about our own? And they stood, and the Bible says they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers because of the generation, because their fathers did not pass down the word of God to them, okay? And so confession is the pathway to restoration to God. Notice it, it listen, confession is the pathway to the restoration of God because the opposite of confession is concealing, this idea that, that we come face to face with our sin and we kind of minimize it, we kind of cover it up, we kind of conceal it, we think, well, I don't want anybody to know about this. Hey, God already knows about it. You might as well confess it. We talk about secret sin in the church. There's no such thing. Did you know that? Well, I, you know, there's a lot of secret. There's no such thing as secret sin. Why? Because God sees it all. You say, well, my spouse doesn't know. God knows. My children don't know. God knows. The church doesn't know. God knows. So there is no such thing as secret sin. But if we're not careful, we'll kind of get into this place where we, you know, we, 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 we got this over here and we want to kind of cover it up. And, you know, you got a stain on this altar. And so what we do is we conceal it and we cover it up. Guess what? It's still there. You can cover it up and you can conceal it and you can act like it's not there, but it's still there. Here's the beautiful thing about confession. That it's uncomfortable because conviction is uncomfortable. But the beautiful thing about confession is the promise that is attached to confession. 1 John 1, 9, one of my favorite scriptures in all of the Bible. If, somebody say if. if. If we confess our sins, not if I confess Donnie's sins, or if I confess Alan's sins, or Glenn's, or Basil's. If we confess our sins, that God is faithful is anybody thankful that God is faithful and that God is just? Not only is God faithful, but he's also just. Here's the thing. God can do what God can forgive you and still be right. Man, that's amazing right there. God is faithful and God is just to forgive us of all sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God, through confession... Remember, if we confess, that forgiveness and that cleansing, it doesn't come if you're concealing and it doesn't come if you're covering it up. But if we confess it, God, my altar's stained. I've got a mess here. God, I'm, I'm confessing it. I'm bringing it to you. I'm coming in alignment with you. If I confess that, that God is faithful and just to forgive us, he wipes our debt, and then not only that, he cleanses us as if it's never been there before. That's the amazing thing. But you know what? Confession requires a lot of humility. 
Confession requires us to, to, to come before God and allow him to convict us. By the way, that when we sing about Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Be careful what you're singing in church. When, when, when you really sing that from all of your heart, you know what God just might do? He might just show up in your life and show you the depths of your heart. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And he might just confront you with sin, and he might just ask you for a confession to be made right there in his presence. If we confess our sins, confession is the pathway to, to restoration to God. And so the word of God had been proclaimed, Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 9. So here's the word of God. It's being read for six hours, a quarter of a day. Here they are, and they're hungry. They're on the edge of their seats. And, and, and not only uh, are they broken, but they're also confessing their sins before an almighty God. You know what I've noticed, and I need to move quickly. I've noticed sometimes people have a way of confessing to others, but they don't confess to God. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus. That means more than anybody else. Now, I do believe that it is biblical principle of confessing your faults to one another. James chapter 5, verse number 16. It is scriptural. And I, but listen, if, if I confess to you and I haven't confessed to God, that confession doesn't, may, may, it doesn't do anything. Because the reality is your spouse can't forgive you, but God can your friends cannot pardon you. Your friends didn't go to the cross for you and, and, and your accountability partner, they didn't die for you on Calvary, but Jesus did. So we confess to him first, then we confess our faults to a, 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 an accountability partner, so to speak, a spouse, a, a helper, a brother, a sister in the Lord. And, and I believe that's biblical so that somebody can hold us accountable for our actions. But confession, it's a byproduct of conviction from God. And we're living in a generation, I, 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 I just, I've got to move quickly here, but we're living in a generation that when it comes to church, they want no conviction. You know what that means? No conviction means there's no God. No conviction means there's no God. Why? Because Jesus said when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. See, it's, it's not my job to convict you. I can't convict you. I can condemn you, okay? Preachers can, and if they're not careful, will be, you know, pointing fingers and, and condemnation. There's a huge difference between a, a preacher sharing the word of God and God convicting you and a preacher condemning you. Condemnation goes nowhere. It, it doesn't, it's not helpful, but the Holy Spirit, when conviction comes, God allows us to repent and to come back into fellowship with him. Amen? So the first thing that we see here is the, the, the conviction of God that took place through the reading and the proclamation of the word of God. Then in verse number six, not only do we see the conviction of God, but then we see the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. Where do we see that? Well, once again, remember, verses number seven through 30 are all this long prayer of the people of Israel recounting the history and the faithfulness of God. What did this prayer, um, what, what was wrapped up in this prayer? It could be broken down into three basic segments. First off, verses 7 through 18 deal with the forming of the nation. Remember, it was an act of God's grace when God chose Abram and revealed himself to him. Remember, Abram was an idolater from a pagan city, okay? From Ur of the Chaldeans. And so God, not because uh, of anything that Abram did, but God in his grace, he chose Abraham, or Abram, and God made a covenant with Abram. And God, God made a covenant, and he says, I'm going to bless all nations through your name and through your seed. Okay? And so what we see here is the faithfulness of God on display in the forming of the nation of Israel. Okay, God chose Israel. The Bible says they are a chosen generation. The Bible teaches that they're a chosen nation. And God chose, now let me, let me walk you through this. God chose Israel and God set them apart from all other nations in the world. How did he do this? He did it through the law. Through the ceremonial aspect of the law. 
And, and as you study through the book of Leviticus, sometimes if, if we don't have this understanding of what God was doing and what God was trying to accomplish through that, Israel was never made right with God through keeping of the ceremonial law. What the ceremonial law did and all the feasts and, and, and all the different offerings and everything, all of that was, everybody look right up here, was to separate them apart from every other nation. Because God always wants his people to be distinct from everyone else. There will be a people of God and there's going to be a distincting mark for us, for them it was the law, for us it's the spirit of God. We have God living inside of us, New Testament believers. The distinction between a believer, a follower of Christ, and somebody that is not is the Spirit of God. It's the in, uh, uh, earnest inheritance of our expectation. And so it's the down payment until Jesus comes. The Spirit is evidence that we belong to God. Okay? But for, for the Old Testament saints, it was the ceremonial aspect of the law. God gave them through Leviticus, and what he was doing is he was separating them from every other nation. And he was forming them by his grace that God was going to, think about this, God was going to reveal himself through his people to the rest of the world. Wow. The forming of the nation. And we see God's faithfulness. So, so part of this prayer here is that you're going to see through Abram, and how God changed his name to Abraham and how God made a covenant with him. Uh, by the way, God initiates every covenant made with mankind. You don't make a covenant with God, God makes a covenant with you. And even when you remain unfaithful, God <coughs> remains faithful because he initiates and ratifies every covenant ever made with mankind. We need to understand the covenantal aspect that God has made with mankind. Um, this idea that God's going to write you off. No, he's made a covenant with you. God loves you. He is, he, he is, he's all in, so to speak, into this with you. That, that God's not, he, he's not giving you part of himself. God's not giving you three quarters. No, God is giving you all of himself. And he's, and he's proved it through a covenant that he's made with you. So through the forming of the nation, uh, God made the promise that through Abraham, his seed, all the nations will be blessed. And ultimately, we know that this promise was climaxed uh, through God sending his own son through the seed, eventually through the seed of Abraham. Um, and so the forming of the nation. The next thing that we see uh, through this prayer, the faithfulness of God, is the leading of the nation. Notice that, that 40 years of wilderness wanderings, the wanderings that God never forsook his people. God continued to lead his people. Remember, what's the scripture say? Go back and read this. I'm, I don't have time. But remember, even in the wilderness wanderings, God led his people by a cloud by day and fire by night. Okay? God was correcting his people during this time, but he was still leading them. Okay? So he led them uh, by a cloud by day and a fire by night. And then notice, he fed them with manna from heaven. He gave them water from the rock to drink. And he gave them victory over, his in, over their enemies. Uh, remember, he gave them clothing that never wore out. Go back and read it. It's all recounted right here in this prayer. Think about this. God gave shoes to the people that the souls never wore out. God gave clothing to the children of Israel that never became tattered and torn. This is incredible. What are we talking about? The faithfulness of God. So think about this. Stay with me. Remember, we're in Nehemiah. What is going on here? They have been separated from the law. They, they haven't been reading the law. They haven't been studying the law. They haven't been hearing the law. But now all of a sudden they are again. And so what they're doing is that they're confessing their sins, but they're also recounting because they've just been hearing about all that God has done. They're recounting the faithfulness of God. Through this prayer is they're, they're recounting history. By the way, one of the greatest promises that we have of the faithfulness of God is our past. If God has been faithful to us then, God is still going to be faithful to us today. God brought us through last year God's going to bring us through this year. Some of you, maybe 2019 hasn't started off so well. Anybody in that, you don't have to raise your hand, but anybody just feel like, man, 2019, we're, we're a couple months in, and it just, it just hasn't been what I expected. I wish that, that the 2000 was going off, 19 was in a, a better, listen, I just want you to understand 
that if God brought you through 2018, he'll bring you through 2019. That's what this is about. Recalling the faithfulness of God. Even in their will, he was leading the nation. And so this is a prayer of reminder. They're reminding themselves. You know, sometimes we need to preach the gospel to ourselves to remind us the history of God and the history of his faithfulness. And, and, and that's, that's what they're doing. So we see the forming of the nation, the leading of the nation, and then ultimately 23 for, through 30 is the chastening of the nation. God made a covenant with his people. He remained faithful to that covenant. His people, on the other hand, did not remain faithful. After all God did for his people, they refused to bow down to his authority and refused to obey his will. Let's be reminded God has given us a free will. God has given Israel a free will. God does not force us to obey him. God does not force us to serve him. And so because of their disobedience over a, a, a prolonged period of time, God chastised the nation and allowed them to be defeated by their enemies, Babylon. But God remained faithful. Think about this. When Israel obeyed God, God remained faithful. When Israel disobeyed God, God remained faithful. When Israel asked for mercy, God remained faithful. What do we see in this prayer? The faithfulness of God. That God is always good. That God is always faithful. If you believe it, shout a big amen. amen. And the last thing that I want you to see is the grace of God in this chapter. Notice the grace of God. Look at verse 31. Go ahead. Get your, if, you, if you've closed your Bible, please open it back up. Follow along. If you follow on your iPad or your phone, please follow. I'm going to give you just a second. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse number 31. You have to see God's grace in, in action. You have to see God's grace on display here because I think you'll see a parallel in your life. I think you'll see a parallel in my life uh, through the, the grace of God on display in Nehemiah chapter 9. Notice what this, the scripture says. Nehemiah chapter 9. We're going to start down in verse number 31. Nehemiah 9 and 31, talking about the grace of God. This is what he says. Nevertheless, after the chastisement of God, nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them. What they're saying is, God, you didn't write your people off. God, you could have made an end of the nation. Everybody look right up here. God formed the nation. He could have disingrained, he could have, whatever that word is, he could have, there you go, somebody smarter than I am, the nation just as quickly. God gives and God takes away. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Listen, this, let, let me just tell you this. God is not a God who gives eternal life and takes eternal life away. That's not God. And we have, if, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll, we'll live our Christian life in a way that we are so fearful that God's gonna take eternal life away from us. Listen, that's not who God is. God, God could have made an end to the nation. And this is what, this is part of the prayer. Lord, you had every right. What about your life? What about my life? God had every right to take my life a long time ago, but he didn't make an end to my life. What about you? You know what it is? It's the grace of God. Why did he not make an end to the nation of Israel? Only because of his grace. Why are you still standing today in the year 2019 only because of his grace? God could have made an end to you. I don't know what your sins are, but this is what I do know. Everyone in this room has them, and, and there's an accuser of the brethren, and the enemy would accuse you of everyone, and the reality is there's enough evidence stacked against you that God could have made an end to your life. But he didn't. God, you could have, but you didn't. You could have made an end to the nation. That's what they're, the, what they're saying here. Verse 31 uh, you, nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and a merciful God. Thank you, Lord. You are a gracious and a merciful God. 
Look at, now therefore, O oh, our God, the great and mighty and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardships seem little to you that has come upon us, our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria till this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. Some of you are facing very difficult days. Can I just remind you that God is still righteous in all that comes upon you? See, the enemy wants to turn you against the righteousness of God. The enemy wants to turn you against the goodness of God because we live in a sin-cursed, fallen world. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Would you say amen? Sometimes things happen that don't make sense in this life. And that's what happened in Israel. And and the word of God declares, yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. Whatever came into our lives did not change the fact that you are still God, that you are still righteous, and that you are still good. What a declaration. And then it says, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. God, you have been faithful, but we have been wicked. What kind of God? You know, that's, that's not like you and I. Because when people act wicked to us, we typically don't respond by being faithful. We just don't. We, we, we battle the flesh, and we kind of have this idea, okay, if, if that's the way that you want to be, then you can be that way, I'm done with you. Life moves on. Hope you had a great life. Hope life treats you well. Sayonara, goodbye. I'm done with you. When people act wickedly to us, that's the way that we typically respond. But God, even though they acted wicked, God still remained faithful. I want to ask you a question. How can you not love a God like our God? How can we not love a God that in spite of our wickedness will still remain faithful to us and will still love us, will still lead us, will still provide for us, will still stay faithful to his covenant towards us? How can we not love him? And you know that's really all that God asks of us. You say, what does God expect of me today? After all that God has done, what is, I'll tell you, it really, it's wrapped up in this. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind and all of your strength. That's really, that's all God wants from you. It's to love him. Love him. And if you love me, he says, you'll keep my commandments. Everything else will take care of itself. If you just love me supremely, first and foremost, no one above me, if you just love me first, everything else will take care of itself. And I just say to you, and I, I, I just proclaim to you, how can we not love our God who loves us that much? Man, restoration has taken place in Nehemiah chapter 9. I mean, the people, are, they're confessing their sins. You know, they're reading the law. They're recounting the faithfulness of God. And, and, and things are happening now. The outside's taken care of, and now God's working on the inside. And, and, and there's great rejoicing that is ahead in the book of Nehemiah. All because of the restoration that God is doing inside of his people. Can I just remind you of this? If the music team will come, I want to remind you of this verse right here, and I'm done. The Bible says, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You know, when God brings conviction into your life, it's a time of weeping. It's a time of mourning. I I despise when God convicts me. I'm just being honest. I don't know anybody that loves correction. I don't know anybody that just says, Yeah, I, I want you to, uh, to, to chastise me. I want you to correct me. No, it doesn't feel good. Hebrews 12 reminds us of that. It's not joyous in the present, but it's what God brings out of it that becomes joyous. So their weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. There's a time and a season for all things. But if you want the pathway to God, if you really want God's attention, you have to be broken, 
You have to confess your sins to him and be reminded that God has never forsaken his people. Let's bow for prayer.